Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Kathy McGrath and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 17, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. And today's issue of the Nipua Banner and Press is for Friday, December 15th, 2023. And right here on the front is a beautiful picture. Christmas isn't a season, it's a feeling. This image from Jody Baker Photography captures the beauty of a Christmas tree located at the Commerce Street Lookout in Nipua. The, this photo and others from the Jody Baker collection can be purchased at Home Hardware, Mullen Sky General Store, Arts Forward, Harris Pharmacy, or her Facebook page. Now, Nipua receives inflation relief by Owen Devereaux. It feels as though the cost of everything has gone up over the last 12 to 18 months, and it's not just you or I who are feeling the effects. Municipalities, such as the town of Nipua, for example, are being impacted as well. Fortunately, though, Nipo has just received a bit of unexpected inflation relief from the province. In early December, town administration received a letter from the office of Ian Bushy, the Minister of Municipal and Northern Relations. The correspondent stated that community would be receiving $435,875 in infrastructure funding to help fund priorities, including inflation. That amount is Nipua's per capita share of a 39.9 million funding announcement that was made earlier this year. This $435,875 funding is available for you to help fund your priorities, including inflation, that you may be facing this year, relayed Colleen Sischian, Nipua's chief administrative officer, via the provincial letter. Sinchishan added that the letter stated that this money must be spent before the year 2026. This new funding could be used to assist with paying for several local priorities, including the previously approved expansion of water and sewer in Nipua, for example. Council acknowledged and thanked the province for this support. And University of Manitoba students propose opportunities for change in Nipua by Casper Wareham. In the picture, students from the University of Manitoba presented a series of ideas that could potentially pursued to improve the community. Pictured above, starting at front from left to right, are students Ebenezer Akakbo, Jessica Miranda, Evan Ferguson, Niha Prakesh, Jillian Kalodi, and John Bianbi. Pictured behind them is their professor, M Richard Milgram. Nipua is an ever-growing community, and with that growth comes change, such as new businesses, new schools, and new healthcare facilities. But what other changes could be made? Are there ways to improve upon Nipua's existing features or add new ones? To create a more age-friendly community? These are the questions that a group of University of Manitoba students for the Faculty of Architecture, Department of Planning, sought to answer. Over the course of a few months, students Ebenezer Akakpo, Jillian Kalodi, John Bianbo, Jessica Miranda, Evan Ferguson, and Niha Prakesh have been visiting Nipua to study the community. On December 11th, the group presented their findings to the public and town staff members at the Yellowhead Manor. An opportunity for those in attendance to provide further feedback was also available at the conclusion of the presentation. Their study of our community was based on the World Health Organization's Global Age-Friendly Cities, a guide. Pros and cons. Mm -hmm. A series of Nipua's strengths and challenges were acknowledged for different aspects of life in the community. Strengths included availability of development areas for new housing, availability of different levels of assisted living, easy access to services, a good sense of safety, 
evenly distributed outdoor seating, handy van availability, convenient parking, and more. Challenges included a lack of affordable homes for families and workers, a growing number of single person households needing accommodations, few public washrooms, potholes, and uneven streets, diagonal parking on Mountain Avenue that creates blind spots, cyclists making it difficult for older adults to use sidewalks, and more. Development proposals. With these aspects of their town in mind, Akakbo, Kolodi, Bianbo, Miranda, Ferguson, and Prakish presented a variety of ideas to help address the challenges the town faces. These pitches included ideas related to housing development, accessibility for older adults, recreation and safety, such as the addition improvement of sidewalk bump outs along Mountain Avenue to help make it easier, safer to cross, the addition of bike multi-use lanes, further development of the flats to add more recreational opportunities, including flood adoptive options in order to gain benefit from the flood prone area not currently being used, improving continuity of sidewalks in some areas, Zoning recommendations for further housing development, such as legalizing and incentivizing housing above commercial storefronts, creating additional pedestrian crossing to improve walkability and safety, and more. The full presentation will be available on NAC TV. The boards used during the presentation are currently being edited further, with a final version and report being provided to the town of Nipua in January. <coughs> Home Buddies from Rita Friesen. Snippets of songs. As far back as I can remember, music has been important to my family lines. Some of my aunts were music teachers. Several of my uncles and one of my cousins were co choir directors in churches and in schools. And it was a rare family that didn't have at least one person that played the piano and guitar. Table Grace, sung in four-part harmony, sent shivers up my back. Music has such power to comfort, to encourage, and to engage. The sunrises have been absolutely gorgeous many mornings lately, and I'm up to witness them. More than once, viewing the glorious array of colors beaming through the sky, the words of him written way back in 1828 soar through my mind. When morning gilds the skies, my heart awakening cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. Uttering these words aloud sets the tone for my day. It is humbling recognition that all that beauty out there for everyone to see and take note of is a gift. When I settle back in my chair mid-morning to give my leg a rest, it is my custom to watch a little television, usually a home reno show or a nature film. But this particular morning while channel surfing, there was a gospel group that I appreciate singing. And being from a people that sing, I stopped to watch. The first song I caught was, Lord, I hope this day is good quite took my breath away for it is a song that was often sung, hummed, or strummed in my home. Every one of my children and most of my grandchildren would know by heart. Settling into music was refreshing and encouraging, filling my heart and mind with countless precious memories. Such a simple thing is a randomly captured song changed the trajectory of my thoughts for the better. It has become my custom to take one more slow, careful walk around the neighborhood after dark. The Christmas lights in our end of the town are spectacular, and I am close enough to the railway tracks that if I wish, I may walk in enough darkness to catch the northern lights. This winter folks have shared incredible photos of this natural phenomenon. I have seen glimpses of the dancing light angels at play, but not like some have seen. As we walk, my dog and I, we note the changing of the seasons on the moon, the reflection of its rays on snow and ice. It is a walk this portion of the pathway that the world words on a cold winter's night, every star shone so bright, a phrase from a Christian hymn comes to mind. And I ponder how it is that I get to live in such safety and comfort. How is it that I have no fear of bombs, no dread of hunger, no crippling ill health? I have enough and to share what a gift. And then the music does a shift, words written more than a century ago. Silent night, holy night. Fill my heart and mind, the gift of music, generation to generation. And there's an update here of the Golden Screen Stream School, the 1954 update. For those interested, all the names have now been provided for ev all the individuals in this picture. And I'm sure some of you know them. Um, 
let's see, Linda Flake, Faye Chapman, who was Linda Flake, Faye Clayton, and those pictured Doug Stewart, Verna Hillman, David Galloway, Bruce Hillman, Carol Anderson, Diana Mayer, Doug Freeburn, Vivian Stewart, Larry Novak, Janice Thiessen, Don Hillman, Bobby Olson, Linda Switzer, Betty Novak, Miss Norma Jacobson, the teacher, John McConnell, Walter Lobin, Roger McConnell, Chucky Duke Quist, John Mayer, Gwen Switzer, Leonard Thiessen, Sylvia Brown, Linda Flake Clayton, and Richard Thiessen. So if those of you are interested, the names are there. <coughs> and Nipua Town Council Review's Long-Term Active Transportation Plan by Owen Deverell. Nipua is taking a much closer look at how to enhance its active transportation options. Active transportation, AT, is defined as human-powered mobility, such as biking, walking, or rolling. In recent years, many municipalities have been looking to provide more safe and viable routes for non-motorized traffic. The town of Nipua is no exception, as on Dece Tuesday, December 5th, Administration and Council heard a presentation from the consulting firm, firm Urban Systems. The presentation included public engagements in the form of an online survey, as well as speaking with locals on the subject during the Chamber Fair back in May. The results of those answers suggest that there is a desire to expand active transport. A lot of the answers on just how to do that revolved around an expansion of pedestrian options, as well as better promotions of active transportation at a local level. For existing barriers to AT, those surveyed said a lack of pedestrian and cy cycling facilities prevented them from walking or cycling more often. Some examples of these lacking facilities are accessibility, widened shoulders, neighborhood bikeways, painted bike lanes, level raised crossings and rapid rectangular flashing beacons. Other concerns raised included per poorly maintained roads and a lack of crossing options, especially along the highway. How do we get there? As for how the town could reach its goal of expanding, urban systems suggested several options to enhance active transportation over the next decade. Those include the expansion of sidewalks from the existing wet work network, including in the short term, one to two years, Mill Street from 5th Avenue to PTH number 5, north side of Commerce Street from Mountain to Rosedale, the medium term, two to five years, Howden Avenue from Poole Street to Stonehouse, Stonehouse from Howden to PTH number 5, north side of Highway 16 from the edge of McDonald's property to Highway 16 PTH 5 intersection, north side of Bryden Street from 2nd Avenue to Crocus Drive, and east side of 2nd from Bryden to Commerce. Long term, five plus years, east side of PTH 5 from Stonehouse to intersection of 5 and 16, west side of Highway 5 from Highway 16, Highway 5 intersection to north edge of Boston Pizza parking lot, east side of 2nd Avenue from 16 to Vivian Street, north side of Vivian from 2nd to Mountain, east side of 1st from Vivian to Ada Street Park Lane Drive intersection, north side of Hamilton Street from Walker Avenue to Tupper Avenue, north side of Mill Street from 279 Mill to Tupper Avenue, middle of Tupper running north from Tupper Mill intersection to connection of Riverside Park. In regard to the expansion of biking options, propo proposed cycling network improvements include, in the short term, one to two years, multi-use paths alongside Park Lane, Lane Drive from Park Lane Ada Street intersection around Park Lake to Brown Avenue McGill intersection, and alongside Hamilton Avenue expansion from Broadway Avenue to Nipua Road. Medium term, two to five years, along west side of Broadway from Highway 16 to Valley multi-use path on north, north side of White Mud River, and long term, over five years, from 240 meters east of number five to Commerce with a spur to connect Nipua First Baptist Church. From number five along the northern edge of Boston Pizza parking lot to West Park Place and from Veterans Way to West Creek Crescent and alongside the west side of Rosedale Avenue from Commerce to Hurl Road. And there's a letter to the editor. When is it going to stop? And shown above in the pictures are examples of the damage done to the recreational trail near Kilwood. 
The trailblazers have found multiple instances of large stones being moved to block trails, as well as trees being cut and laid across the paths, and evidence of motor motorized machinery. Well, folks, there is a trail one mile north of Kilwood, two miles west, and a jot to the south, and then straight west. It's a recreational trail. As part of the trailblazers, we take pride in maintaining these trails. But recently, the trail has been sabotaged again. One of our members paid to get it professionally surveyed to make sure it was not on anyone's property. This trail is on Crown land. Rosedale Municipality Road Allowance. Let me state again, some people are saying the Rosedale Municipality paid for the survey to be done. This is completely false. It was paid for by one of the trailblazers. It is getting very dangerous to walk up there. Somebody is going to get seriously hurt or killed. Someone has dug a six foot deep trench with backhoe across the trail and put huge boulders across as well as falling trees across the trail. The trailblazers went and filled in the trench by hand and put back the wooden bridge, moved the stones off the trail so people can safely walk up there again. This has happened again. This time we have taken pictures. They have cut down about 10 trees and placed them across the trail. Also, they placed huge boulders on the trail again. It looks like these boulders were put there with a tractor. People have spoken with the conservation office and you are not allowed to cut trees or use heavy equipment on Crown land. This has occurred two or three times. When is this going to stop? The stones are so big it is impossible for us to move them. We hope Manitoba Conservation and Crown Lands will investigate the matter and consult with the arm of Rosedale to rectify the issue. If not, we will be forced to look into going somewhere else to have this resolved. This has got to stop before someone gets hurt. Please take our concerns seriously and again, we need this resolved. And one more note, the trailblazers hope conservation officers in the Rosedale municipality get together and clear the trail this time. Several of us volunteer trailblazers have been doing it on our own. And that was submitted by Larry Henton, Ron Roach, and Robert Barron. <coughs> and Stuart Kinley receives Cowboy Hall of Fame award by Ken Waddell. And pictured Stuart Kinley, formerly of Gladstone, and his wife Tierney and their sons Dawson and Corbin. The Western Heritage Museum in Lee County Cowboy Hall of Fame is a museum near Hobbs, New Mexico. Recently, the Hall of Fame announced their 2023 inductees. Among the inductees is a young man who was born and raised at Gladstone, Manitoba. The 2023 Silver Concho Award was presented to Stuart Kinley. Kinley was born and raised at Gladstone. From an early age, growing up on the family farm near Gladstone, Stewie was enamored with anything dealing with horses, cattle, rodeo, and sports. His parents, Don and Lorna Kingley, and brother Dwight, would help him chase his dreams any way they could. He started junior rotaring, where they rode steers, then junior bulls. By the time Kinley was in high school, he was riding bulls, bareback, and saddle bronc. He was the Canadian high school all-round champion in his senior year. Kinley also team roped and roped a few calves as well. He attended South Plains College in 2006 on a rodeo scholarship where he could rodeo for Joss Crow and Clay Harden. Completing his diesel technician certificate and moving to Lovington, Texas, Kinley decided to pursue an associate's degree from NM Junior College and rodeo for coach Philip Berry. In 2010, Kinley moved to Portales, New Mexico to get his Bachelor of Applied Science from Eastern New Mexico University, Mining and General Agriculture. Kinley eventually moved back to Canada to be close to family, rodeo, and work on his uncle's cattle and grain farm. In 2015, Kinley married his college sweetheart, Tierney O'Connor, from Portales. They lived, they lived in Portales for the next couple of years, where Stewie started up a mobile wash business, and Tierney started her Little Bits mini donut factory. In the fall of 27, Kinley was hired as the head co-head rodeo coach and coached with his friend Clay Bonner for several years. In February 2018, Kinley and Tierney welcomed their first son, Dawson, and then again in February 2020, they welcomed their second son, Corbin. Kinley is excited to raise his boys in the Western culture, whether that be roping, sports, or working their small cow herd together. Kinley has worked at NMJC for the past seven years and has a passion for helping students. He looks forward to passing on the opportunities he was given and believes life is about being good to others. He also enjoys team roping and making good horses. 
In addition to the awards, a number of NMJC Rodeo and Equine scholarships were also given at the conclusion of the dinner. One of the priorities of the Lee County Cowboy Hall of Fame has always been to identify and help deserving students at NMJC complete their education. And Harvest for Hockey is back by Ken Waddell. The Nipua Titans are on a winning streak that was highlighted this past weekend with a 6-3 victory over the league leading Steinbach Pistons. The team is hoping to extend their winning ways on and off the ice. For the 2023-24 season, the Harvest for Hockey program is back. Nipawan Titans president, Jamie Benbo, said, The ag community in the area surrounding Nipua are incredibly powerful when they get behind something. The team would really appreciate it if grain growers would donate an acre of production to the Nipua Titans account as you haul in this year's bountiful crop. Each 50 to 100 bushel donation would go towards our $40,000 go so that we can pay off our CEBA loan, Denbo stated. Our need is a now we need is now. We need to pay off this loan by January 18th, 2024, and growers can make a donation to the following grain elevators that have a Nipua Titans account. The elevators are Richardson Pioneer at Minnedosa, Dundonald, p &H at Gladstone, Viterra at Forest, and G3 at Bloom. Denbo explained that's in it, what's in it for grain farmers. Make a Harvest for Hockey donation and then come party to watch the hottest team in the MJHL. The Emperor's Lounge private entertainment area will be reserved for all day donors for our February 2nd, 2024 game with drinks and snacks provided. Dembo said, come catch up with your neighbours, watch some great hockey and have a great time on us. And Nipua Titans lend a helping hand. Several members of the Nipua Titans Hockey Club, including Garrett McDonald, number eight, and Cody Goodenson, number 26, assisted with the annual Nipua Salvation Army Kettle Campaign. This fundraiser is one of Canada's largest and most recognizable annual charitable events, and they're pictured to the left. So, Hayden Stocks, glad to be back in Nipua. 20-year-old forward helping turn Titans into legitimate threat. Pictured since returning to Nipua, Hayden Stocks has contributed 19 points, 13 goals, and 6 assists. This is by Owen Devereaux. The recent hot streak of the Nipua Titans can't be attributed to just one single player. Having said that, it is interesting to see the timing between the recent run of success and the return of forward Hayden Stocks to town. The 20-year-old from Edmonton came back to Nipua in early November after a stint in the North American Hockey League. In just 14 games with the Titans since then, Stocks has already contributed 19 points. That has him on a blistering 58-point pace for the end of the year, surpassing his output from last season in far fewer games. Back in a great community. After starting the year in, in Minot, North Dakota, Stocks' NHL playing rights were traded to a team in Danbury, Connecticut. While that nearly 4,000 kilometers between Danbury and home for Hayden may have been a factor, Stock said there was another bigger reason for coming back to the MJHL and the Nipua Titans. I enjoyed playing here last year. It was a great community and just a great atmosphere in the rink. I enjoy this town and enjoy play for the Titans, GM and head coach Ken Pearson, said Stocks. It's been good to be back. I was gone for a few months and when I told Kenny I wanted to come back, he was excited to have me. I think we have a real good group this year. The last few weeks it's come together out there and we've been able to win some games. One of the reasons for the recent successes, the positivity of this reunion is felt behind the bench as well. In a recent article published on the MJHL website, head coach Ken Pearson cited Stock's return as a notable part of the team's recent run. We made a few moves about a month ago with an, our decor and added up the front guy like Hayden Stock certainly helps. He had success scoring for us last year and is built on that. It allows guys to slot down into a more natural spot where they could thrive. The guys have really come together and on and off the ice, and I believe that's been a big reason for the recent success, stated Pearson. As for the rest of the season, Stock simply hopes to keep contributing to the club's success as best he can. He added that there are several players on the roster who are stepping up on the given night to be the guy. We could put anybody with anybody out there right now on the line and produce something offensively. We're a close group and it feels as though this isn't just one line. Everyone is producing out there, contributing to this recent success, and that's a nice thing to have. 
and the Gladstone Lakers win high scoring game over the Nipua Farmers. Results from the Tiger Hills Hockey League by Owen Devereaux. And pictured Kyle McDonald of the Nipua Farmers attempts to get a puck past go Gladstone goaltender Matt Coleman. <coughs> a 6.9 from Jory, Jory Geddes helped push the Gladstone Lakers to a 10 6 win over the Nipua Farmers on Saturday, December 9th in the Tiger Hills Hockey League. Geddes contributed three of Gladstone's first five goals of the game and also picked up a trio of assists on the night. His teammate, Kobe Campbell, also had a hat trick, while Jesse Toth added two to go along with lone goals from Tom Coots and Connor Grunston. Nipua, meanwhile, saw Kyle McDonald, two goals, one assist, Zach Hicks, two goals, Garrett Rempel, one goal, two assists, and Brett Lewandowski, one goal, one assist, score for the Farmers. Other notable contributors were Gladstone's J.C. Kennedy and Nipua's Ward Susky, who each had four assists, credited them on the night. The win improved the Lakers' record to 6-2-0 and zero on the season, good enough for a third place in the East, and just two points back of the Minnedosa Bombers, 7-2-0 and zero in the standings. As for the Bombers' weekend, they defeated the Suris Elks 5-2. Minnedosa was led by five different goal store scorers. Upcoming local schedule. Several of the local teams are back in action this week, including the Carberry Plainsmen, who last played on December 1st. Their next game will be December 15th in Wawanisa versus the Jets. Other notable local games include the Nipua Farmers, Friday, December 15th in McGregor, Gladstone Lakers, Saturday, December 16th in Verdon, and Minnedosa Bombers, Friday, December 22nd in Wawanisa. And Nipua Under-13 Titans holds a tournament. Six teams from across the prom province participated in the Nipua Minor Hockey U-13 tournament over the weekend. The host team, the U13 Titans, played McCreary and Rivers in the round robin. Nipua beat McCreary 6-1, but were defeated by Rivers 4-3. In the semifinals, Nipua faced Brandon, while Rivers took on Minnedosa. The U13 Wheat Kings beat the Titans 6-4, while the Rivers Jets doubled up the Bombers 6-3. In the tournament final, Brandon defeated Rivers to claim top spot. Congratulations to Brandon on the win and to Nipua for hosting an amazing weekend. And pictured on the left, Nipua's Brooks Hawken advances the puck into the Brandon zone on one of the two semifinal games on Sunday, December 10th. And the NAC Tigers win over Crocus Plains, Hamiota. Derek Lapointe, number 25, advances on the Crocus Plains goaltender in Nipua's 5-1 win over the Plainsmen on December 6th. This win, along with a victory over Hamiota on December 12th, has improved the NACI Tigers' regular season record to 8-1-0 and one and zero by Owen Devereaux. The Nipua Tigers continued to power their way through the early portion of their schedule in the Westman High, Ho High School Hockey League. One of their latest efforts out there was a 5-1 home win over the Crocus Plains Plainsmen on Wednesday, December 6th. And the only reason this game didn't get a little more out of hand was thanks to a great individual effort from Crocus Plains goaltender Shelby Brown, who made 43 saves on the night. A goaltender can only hold down the figurative fort for so long, however, until the more talented team starts to take control. And that's exactly what happened in Nipua on this night. The Tigers peppered Brown with 19 shots in the first period, but were only able to get one past him, as Callan Denbo scored his third of the regular season. After 20 minutes, shots and goal were, were 19 to six in favor of Nipua. In the second period, the Tigers let up a little bit, but still had a 10 to 4 shots on goal advantage. They did, however, score a few more times. Riley Davey and Tarek Lapointe each generated goals to make a 3-0 score with 20 minutes remaining in regulation. For the third, Davey added one more, his second of the night and ninth of the season to make it 4-0 Nipua. Crocus Plains replied back with one about midway through the period but the Tiger clawed their back, that one back with a Daniel Lissaway opportunity just a few minutes later. That would make the score 5-1 for Nipua. Final shots on goal were 43-18 for the Tigers. NACI 4-1 over Hamiota. A pair of goals from Cole and Klebacki, including the, what would end up being the game winner, sparked the Nipua Tigers to a 4-1 win over the Hamiota Huskies on Tuesday, December 12th. Both of Cohen's goals came in the second period and were his ninth and tenth of the season. Callan Denbo and Riley Davey scored the others for the Tigers, while Austin Michalek made 25 saves to pick up the win in goal for NACI. 
The Tigers will play four more games before Christmas break, with two of those at home. The first is at the Yellowhead Centre, Friday, December 15th, against the Verdon Golden Bears. Next after that will be de 20, December 22nd versus the Dauphin Clippers. A statement victory for the Nipua Tiger Titans earned dominant win over league-leading Steinbach Pistons by Owen Devereaux and pictured as Titans goaltender Casey Cockett prepares for a shot from the point from Connor Peronuzzi, number 16 of the Ste Steinbach Pistons. It just might be time for everyone around the Manitoba Junior Hockey League, MJHL, to start believing in this year's edition of the Nipua Titans. The club has been on an amazing run as of late, going 9-2-0 and two to zero in their last 11 games. Even more impressive than that, over the course of those nine wins, Nipua has bested the first, second, and third best teams in the MA MJHL standings. Their most recent win was a 6-3 decision over the league-leading Steinbach Pistons on December 10th. For the play first two periods of play, it was tightly contested back and forth between the two clubs. Steinbach opened up with a scoring er early with a goal just 19 seconds into the first period. Connor Thompson answered back for the Nipua 33 seconds later, followed by Hayden Stocks collecting his 12th of the year a few minutes after that. The Pistons scored just before the end of the period to tie things up at 2 to 2. The second period featured just one goal apiece for the two teams, with Tim Taconic picking up his eighth of the year at the 6 and 38 mark, and the Pistons replied before the end of the second, making it a 3 3 score going into the final 20 minutes of regulation. Early in the third, Steinbach created several chances, but just couldn't get the puck past KC Cockett. Eventually, Nipawood would start creating their own opportunities, which paid off in spades. Cody Goodenson scored his ninth of the year to give the Titans the lead. A few minutes later, Hayden Stocks broke out on a breakaway while Nipawood was attempting to kill off a mid-period penalty. He put the puck between Steinbach goaltender Cole Plowman to give the Titans the two-goal cushion. Then, with five minutes remaining, Cooper Kasprick added one more, scoring the 6-3 victory for Nipua. Shots on goal were listed online as 21-18 for Nipua, and both teams' power plays went 0-5 for five on the night. Next man up mentality. Ken Pearson, head coach and general manager for the Nipua Titans, told the Banner and Press post-game that the buy-in from the players as of late has been exceptional. It's a confident group, a tight-knit group in that locker room, with guys out of the lineup such as Carter McLeod, Mason Hartley, and Mason Lebrou. It's just been other players stepping in on the new or expanded roles and getting comfortable. It has turned into a next-man-up mentality and is working for us right now, said Pearson. It's great to see because it doesn't seem to matter right now who we put into certain spots. They rise up to the occasion. Our depth has been really great for us this last month. And on top of all that, they just don't want to let each other down. They're battling hard every night. What's next? With the win, Nipua improved its record to 15, 13, and 1, good enough for 31 points in fourth place in the standings. The Titans will close out the 2023 with a pair of road games. First, they will be in Swan River on Saturday, December 16th to play the Stampeders. They'll follow the, that up by traveling to the Paw to face the OCN Blizzard on Sunday, December 17th. The next home game for Nipua will be Friday, January 5th, when they host the Selkirk Steelers. And the Gladstone Market Report. Fluctuations in the temperature may seem nice for mankind, but it's hard on livestock. Cattlemen must keep a keen eye open when looking over their livestock, battling pneumonia and other illnesses that this weather may bring on. The feeder markets was definitely spotty. Seemed like feeder cattle in all classes were seeing signs of pressure, especially second cut and anything rough around the edges. With cattle futures bouncing around and getting to the time of year where feedlots want current pens filled and settled prior to the holidays, we traded 536 cattle through the ring on Gladstone on December 12th. The market saw a variety of cattle and not an abundance of cattle for each weight class, making it difficult to quote a fair market report for every class. The market this week was still under pressure in certain spots. The outlook looks promising as far as fat cattle backlog can hopefully get cleaned up over the holiday break. If so, there will be a lot more optimism in the eastern and western provinces to create a demand for feeder cattle to finish. Grass cattle should be in high demand and the glut of open and cull cows should be behind us, one would hope, for the cow-calf industry. 
The cows are still rolling in by the li liner loads. Cows and bulls traded steadily from 105 to 115, with sales to 128. With consistent averages, bulls traded with more strength, ranging between 130 to 141. All classes of cattle sold well. Plainer type cattle are still being discounted. Here's a look at the feeder market pictured below. Some highlights from the sale, tan steers weighed 420 and they brought 455 per pound. Black steers weighed 553, they brought 385. Red X steers weighed 665 and they brought 336. Black Brothers right to them weighed 709 and they traded for 314. Heifer high pro highlights, mixed heifers, weighed 442 and they could and they brought 352. Crossbred heifers, heifers weighed 513 and traded at 338. A set of tan heifers weighed 620 and they brought 309. And a big set of 785 weight mixed heifers traded for 268. And Carberry Monster Buck Night by Jolene Balcunas. Pictured are some of the award winners from the Carberry Monster Buck Night. Carberry Monster Buck Night was held December 8th with over 180 people in attendance despite the weather conditions. Leonard Birch was our very capable master of ceremonies for the evening. The winners were decided by the scoring of the antlers from each buck. The measuring and scoring was done by this year by Paul Dick, Jason Gunter, Will Allen, Jamie Gunter, Brad Strain, Ryan McConnell, Brad Duncan, Landon Allen, Brent McMillan and Jeff Davison. The winners were the Malcolm McDonald Memorial for Seniors won one by Webb Steele with a score of 135 and 4 eighths. McCain sponsored Best Overall Typical, Tom Gomp with a score of 166. Redfern sponsored Best Overall Non-Typical, William Sikora scoring 169 and 1 eighth. Brian McDonald sponsored Best Overall Ladies, Janelle Reisner scored 138 and 4 eighths. The Dave Elliott Memorial for Best Junior Class, 17 and under. Lucas Baganski with a score of 137. The Dixon family sponsored second in the junior class. Quinton Elliott scored 123. C&T Reynolds Farm sponsored third in the junior class. Dawson Smart scoring 116 and 4 eighths. Carberry Monster Buck Club sponsored Best Buck by Spruce Woods Junior Rifle member Lucas Baganski scoring 137. Most symmetrical over 100 was won by Melanie Clark with a difference of 1.5 inches, also sponsored by Carberry Monster Buck Club. The muzzleloaders class, sponsored by Manitoba Muzzleloaders Association, was won by Travis McMillan, scoring 137. Best overall buck for a member was won by Troy Reynolds, scoring 151 and 38, sponsored by Carberry Monster Buck Club. Carberry Monster Buck Club donated a hunting knife to first-time buck harvesters Abby Jackson, Melanie Clark, Leila Kamali, Blake Hofer, Kevin Elliott, Lucas Baganski, Kayla Sampson, and Brianna Manns. There were three guns to be won. The winners were Richard Zoga Muzzleloader, Colby Brown, 270, Wade Walker, 22250. Cards were also food for a chance to win a hunting knife. Jaron Waldner won the 50-50 draw for $900. Many other prizes donated by our generous sponsors were also awarded to the lucky ticket holders in attendance. Proceeds from Monster Buck Night 2023 were donated to Spruce Woods Junior Rifle for the purchase of equipment and the amount was deposited into an account towards the shooting range when the new recreation centre is built. Thanks to everyone who helped make the evening a success. Xander's Legacy Xander's bright smile, sparkling eyes, and calm, strong spirit were missed by everyone who had the pleasure to meet him. We will forever be grateful to the people in our community for their love and continued support in helping us keep Xander's memory alive and being open to honest, heartfelt conversations. Xander has touched many lives in our community and the greater hockey community opening many conversations for our youth, leaving a legacy in our community. By Jolene Balcunas. In a small, close-knit community like Carberry, Everyone has a small degree of separation, and most are connected in some way. Our community was devastated last January with the heart-breaking news we had lost a young person to his mental health struggles. Suddenly, all our social media profiles had the sweet, smiling face of Xander Campbell, and we held our loved ones a little tighter. Every parent's worst nightmare became reality for Leanne and Cody Campbell. The unthinkable happened to their family. Xander died on January 8, 2023, at the age of 14, 
from an invisible, I undiagnosed mental health illness that was a shock to everyone. Xander was to be a kind, loving, outgoing, thoughtful soul who was wise beyond his year. He loved exploring, spending time in nature, playing sports, and time with his friends and family. He was a fantastic listener who listened to you with his whole soul and could talk to anyone about anything. He was genuinely curious about life and the world around him. Cody and Leanne have added Xander's jersey to a beautiful display alongside a board filled with mental health resources in the lobby of the Carberry Rec Centre. We hope looking at this display will bring awareness to mental health and help people remember what an amazing person Xander was, says Xander's mum Leanne. We are incredibly thankful to Carberry Minor Hockey for helping us honour Xander's memory and for working with us to fulfil his request to raise mental health awareness. <coughs> Leanne and Cody would like to bring attention to a new resource in Canada, 988. Canadians can now call or text 988, which gives you access to high-quality, trauma-informed and culturally appropriate mental health support. This service is free and provides a safe place to talk that can be accessed 24 hours a day, every day of the year. While the focus of the 988 is on suicide prevention, no one who reaches out to the service will be turned away. Whoever you are, wherever you are located in Canada, by calling or texting 988, you can connect with a trained responder who's ready to listen without judgment. 988 is made possible by a network of 39 experienced local, provincial and territorial and national crisis lines and helplines across the country, including Kids Help Phone and Hope for Wellness, whose trained responders will answer calls and texts while also connecting people to a responder in their community. And Memories of Polonia School by Richard Kolbaki, a former Polonia student. And pictured is sister Boniface Zentner, who taught Richard Kolbaki by holding him on her knee while the grades one to three each stood and read to her. Kolbaki says that is how he learned to read. Sister Boniface Zentner was the second last teacher from the Order of St. Benedict to teach in the Polonia Country School. The last teacher was Sister Alfred Chwilaboga after being there from the 1930s from the monastery in Arburg, Winnipeg. Still alive is Sister Gerarda Pura, near 100, who taught in the 1950s. One, Sister Heltrude Kolodechak, possibly taught a career of nearly 60 years. Winter was the exciting season at school. The one and a half hour dinner break was spent sledding down the huge hill. The students were all hoping to get all the way down and under the barbed wire fence and right across the ditch onto the road, and all the while not getting snagged on the fence at the bottom of the hill. The skill required was simple. Just lie down and hugging the sled at the last possible moment to slide under the fence. There were few ve vehicles on the road. It was usually blocked by snowbanks. Sister Gerarda also tells of sledding down that immense hill herself, being given a push at the top. All that was accomplished with veil and skirts streaming in the breezes. Today's teachers, principals, superintendents, or ministers of education would deny any student such exhilarating pleasures while at school. In all those years that the local school existed, no one ever got hurt as far as I have heard. And the Carberry Minor Hockey Weekly Recap by Jolene McCunis. Carberry's under-17 three traveled to Glenborough Saturday morning. Despite missing a few players, the team came away with the win. Goal scorers were Hunter Hume, 16, Caden Snowden, 2, Bailey Holliday, 2, and Maeve, Mav Turner. We had plenty of great defensive plays from Caden, Coulter, Dixon, and Kovu Letkman. Our under-9s had another great weekend, Saturday traveling to Brandon for an exhibition game and came away with a win. Sunday, they traveled to Boise Bain with another win, 14-7. Heading into the Christmas break, being first in their league. The under-11 team hosted their home tournament this past weekend, winning their first game against the Brandon Bisons with an 11-0 win. Goaltender Devian Bromley got, Devlin Bromley got his first shout, shutout of the season, and Liam Huskins received the player of the game with his first hat trick. Their second game against McGregor ended with an 8-3 loss. Brooklyn Holiday helped her teammates out throughout the game and received player of the game. On Sunday, their last game against the Rock Lake Rebels ended with an unfortunate 6-1 loss. Beckham Hofer received player of the game at their final game of the weekend. 
The McGregor Mustangs went on to win the tournament in overtime when they faced off in the final against Rock Lake. And then we have Merry Christmas greetings. And here on the front is Merry Christmas <coughs> from the Nipah Banner Press uh, Banner and Press staff. Picture are Owen Devon, Devereaux, Christine Waddell, Ken Waddell, Casper Wareham, Diane Warner, Katie Ath, Joel Asselstein, Matthew Gagnon, Gloria Kerluk, Sandra Unger, Ray Apita, John Castrens, Bernie Miker, Shannon Robertson, and Betty Pearson. So let's give a hand for that staff. And messages of holiday greetings. Wab Canoe, Premier of Manitoba. On behalf of all Manitobans, it is my honor to bring greetings this holiday season. I am wishing all Manitobans a happy holidays and hope everyone takes time to enjoy this festive season and celebrate with their loved ones. Use this season as an opportunity to rest and reflect on the past year as well as look forward to all the exciting things to come in 2024. Happy holidays, wishing everyone the best in 2024. The Honorable Wab Canoe, Premier of Manitoba. Dan Mazier, Member of Parliament. This Christmas season, as you gather with family and friends, let us take a moment to reflect on the spirit of Christmas that unites our communities. Christmas is a season of giving, and by reaching out to those less fortunate, we embody the spirit of the season. I know that rural communities are home to an abundance of generosity and compassion, so let's extend a helping hand to our neighbours who are facing challenges during these times of increasing financial pressures. As we give back to those less fortunate, let us also gather to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, for his blessing provides a light of hope around the world. On behalf of my family, I want to wish you and your loved ones a Christmas filled with love, peace, and joy. May the spirit of the holiday season remain in our hearts throughout the year. In your service, Dan Mazier, Member of Parliament. Jody Byram, MLA for Agassiz. It is an honour and a privilege to write my first Christmas message as your member of the Legislative Assembly for Agassiz constituency. This year has been extremely busy and exciting for me and has gone all way too fast. All too often we get caught up in the demands and expectations of our workloads and responsibilities and we forget to take time for ourselves, family and friends. Let the holiday season be a time where you can slow down and reconnect with loved ones and create special memories with family and friends. Embrace your relationships and friendships, whether you celebrate at a distance, amidst illness, illness, grief, or other challenges. And may you find comfort and blessings with those who share the gift of time, kindness, kindness and compassion. May we give thanks in those in our communities who enrich lives of others, to those working in health care and education, to the servicemen and women who protect our country, and to the many businesses and organizations who provide services and products to our communities. We have much to be grateful here in Manitoba. This holiday season, let us share in kindness and respect for one another, offering peace and hope for parts of our world where challenges of much greater turmoil exist. Give the gift of love and gratitude, treasure your friendships, and cherish time with your loved ones this holiday season. I wish everyone a safe and healthy holiday season. Happy New Year and all the best for a great 2024 ahead. Jody Byram, Agassiz MLA. Greg Nesbitt, MLA Riding Mountain. The holiday season is a time when families get together and we take a pause from our day-to-day -day life journey to remember all the great things we share as citizens of the Riding Mountain constituency in the province of Manitoba, in the most wonderful country in the world, Canada. As we celebrate the holiday season with family and friends, we must take time to consider those who have struggled over the past year, whether it was through the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, wildfires, droughts, floods, war, or other tragedies around the world. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues in the Manitoba Legislature to ensure Manitoba re remains one of the best places to live in the world. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a healthy, happy, and prosperous 2024. Greg Nesbitt, MLA Riding Mountain. The Honorable Anita R. Neville, PCOM, Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba. The festive season is traditionally a time of goodwill, celebration, and thoughtful reflection on the year gone by, and the promise of a new one to come. There is a prevailing sense of hope and optimism for the days ahead, stirred by the holiday spirit that so often brings out the very best in Manitobans. How fortunate we are to live in such a welcoming, caring province. 
These admirable traits truly come to the fore during the holidays, reminding us all of our shared community spirit and the immeasurable value of human kindness. The work of numerous charities and other nonprofits shine especially brightly at this time of year, casting a warm glow on the helpfulness and generosity of our citizens in support of each other. As the King's representative in Manitoba, I wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season along with a heartfelt wish for global peace and harmony. May the festive spirit spill your hearts and your homes all this time and all year round, strengthening a sense of gratitude for all of our blessings. The Honourable Anita R. Neville, PCOM, Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba. Mayor Brian Headley, Town of Nipua. As mayor of our vibrant community, I wish to ex I extend warmest greetings to all of you this festive season. It has been an exciting year filled with progress, unity, and resilience. Together we have faced challenges head on and celebrated huge triumphs that will strengthen the fabric of our community for years to come. As we gather with family and friends to celebrate the joy of the season, let us reflect on the spirit of compassion and generosity that defines our community. May the warmth of the season fill your hearts with love and gratitude. Looking ahead to the new year, I am optimistic about the opportunities that await us. <coughs> Excuse me. Together we continue to build a community that thrives on innovation, inclusivity, and sustainability. Let us embrace the possibilities that the future holds and work collaboratively to make our town even stronger. I extend my heartfelt best wishes to each and every one of you for a joyous Christmas and a new year filled with prosperity, good health, and happiness. May the coming year bring new adventures, accomplishments, and moments of shared success. Thank you for being an integral part of our remarkable journey. Here's to a festive season filled with love, laughter, and promise of a brighter future. Warm regards from our family to yours. Brian and Tanya Headley. <coughs> the Council and staff of the Municipal Municipality of St. Rose, wishing a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to all. Mayor Ray Muirhead, Town of Carberry. On behalf of our council staff and Town of Carberry, I would like to send out season's greetings to all. A very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you and your families, and have a safe season. Reeve Rick Sonnenberg, Municipality of McCreary. Season's greetings to all of our residents, family, and friends. Since being elected of Reeve of the Municipality of McCreary one year ago, I've been impressed and proud of the commitment of both the newly elected council members, past members of council, municipal administration, and public works staff and community volunteers for their hard work, dedication, and many hours working on behalf of the municipality. During this season, we take time to reflect upon the good things we have, like our partnership with you. We appreciate working with you and hope that the holidays and coming year will bring you happiness and prosperity. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from the Reeve Council and staff of the Municipality of McCreary. And you'll notice there's a number of Christmas greetings from uh, some of our advertisers. I hope you support them because it's a heartfelt greeting. And also in this week's issue of the Banner and Press are recipes from out of Helen's Kitchen. We have got gingerbread cream cheese roll, raspberry almond slice, carrot own orange loaf, carrot pudding, and a whole nother section of recipes. Braided potato onion bread, candy cane cookies, mum's raisin pie, gluten-free oatmeal banana bars, Pat's deep fried pierogies, lemon poppy seed fruit salad, and again, Christmas greetings from a number of our advertisers and locals. And finally, festival films that make for a perfect family movie night this season. A family movie night makes for a great way for families to bond and enjoy some relaxing time together. Such nights are a tradition in households across the globe, and they can even become a fun way for extended families to celebrate the holidays together. When hosting overnight guests this season, hosts can plan a family movie night and line up any of the f these family-friendly holiday movies. A Christmas Story from 1983. 
This beloved classic, based on the writings of author Gene Shepherds, focuses on young Ralphie Parker and his humorous family. That family includes his father, played to much laughs by legendary actor Darren McGavin. All Ralphie wants for Christmas is a coveted Red Rider air rifle, and generations of fans have enjoyed watching this film to see if Ralphie's dreams come true. Home Alone, 1990. Not unlike a Christmas story, this instant classic devotes much of its story to a young boy. Eight-year-old Kevin McAllister, played by Macaulay Culkin, awakens to an empty house after his parents forgetfully leave him behind as they depart on a holiday trip to Paris with their extended family. This proves to be bad news for bungling burglars Harry, Joe Pesky, Marv, Daniel Stern, who are outwitted by Kevin at every turn. Elf, 2003. Middle-aged Buddy, played by Will Ferrell, grew up in the North Pole believing he is an elf, despite being significantly larger than the kind-hearted elves who raised him. Upon learning he is not an actual elf, but he is determined to reunite with his father, James Caan. He's never known. Hilarity ensues, ensue, ensue, ensues as the innocent buddy ends up in the big city in search of his father. It's a Wonderful Life from 1946. Among the most beloved holiday movies ever made, this classic stars Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey, a devoted family man who set aside his own big city dreams to save the family business and end, ultimately, his small hometown of Bedford Falls. Lamenting some bad luck that leaves him on the cusp of financial ruin, George wishes he'd never been born, only to be shown by an especially kind and patient angel in tra training, Henry Travers, how much worse off Bedford Falls and its residence might have been had George Bailey never existed. Jingle All the Way, 1996, featuring a future governor of California in the lead role, this hijinks-filled holiday classic follows the efforts of Howard Langston, Arnold Schwarzenegger, as he tries to secure the must-have gift of the season for his son, Jamie, Jake Lloyd. Howard soon finds himself competing against a father, Sinbad, who's equally devoted to finding the coveted Turbo Man action figure. A holiday movie might make for fun, family-friendly evening when hosting overnight guests during this special time of year. And that concludes the reading of the Nipah Banner and Press for today, Friday, December 15th, 2023. I hope you enjoyed it.